Hey guys, so in today's video, I want to address Gnosticism. Recently, I came out with a video discussing the Gospel of Thomas, and that video has grown in popularity, but I realized the quality was not that good, and so I really wanted to revisit the Gospel of Thomas in greater detail and discuss some of the more interesting insights that we can gain from looking at this Gnostic scripture. Stay tuned. <laughs> So Gnosticism has really grown in popularity over the last few years and you have, you know, organized classes talking about Gnosticism and people spending money to go on these courses to learn about the secret teachings of Jesus. It's made out to be a lot more insightful than it really is. Our best source for understanding Gnosticism comes to us in the form of the Nag Hammadi Library. And the Nag Hammadi Library represents a collection of these lost Gnostic texts that were buried under the sands when the Orthodox Church issued its edict that only specific books should be read for the cultivation of faith. It's believed that perhaps the Bishop of Egypt ordered that these texts be buried out in the desert because he couldn't bring himself to actually destroy the books. You see, Christian Gnosticism seems to have emerged out of a movement that was referred to as Sethianism. These were Jewish mystics who were coming up with new ideas. They were experimenting with different ways of approaching Judaism by mixing in Platonic ideas and ancient Egyptian ideas. But by the time these concepts reached Christianity, Christianity was just an emerging religious movement, and the Gnostics had a distinct tendency of trying to syncretize different religious beliefs. They wanted to take the beliefs of Jews and the pagan beliefs of Egyptians and the pagan beliefs of Greeks and just sort of merge them all together into one complete mythology. And so when Christianity began to emerge in the first century, the Gnostics started to take these Christian ideas and sort of weave them into their own concepts and ideas. In fact, we find certain scriptures, certain texts within the Gnostic library that make no mention of Christ whatsoever. So for instance, the text, the three steles of Seth, Allogenes, Marcenes, and the thought of Norea make no mention of Christian concepts whatsoever. So these were clearly an established religious movement before the emergence of Christianity even began. One of the most useful texts in the Nag Hammadi library for understanding Gnostic concepts about God in the universe is the Apocryphon of John. This is a pseudepigraphical text that describes the emanation of the eons. So many of the Gnostic concepts concerning God seems to have emerged from some Pythagorean ideas. The Gnostics believed in this concept called the monad, and they said that the monad was this one unitative entity. It was the supreme spirit that was incorporeal and transcendent to everything we can think or know about. Concerning the monad, we read, The monad is a monarchy with nothing above it. It is he who exists as God and father of everything, the invisible one who is above. He is the invisible spirit of whom it is not right to think of him as a god or something similar, for he is far more than a god, since there is nothing above him, for no one lords it over him. He is eternal, he is total perfection, always and completely perfect in light. There is no one prior to him. He is unsearchable, he is immeasurable, he is invisible, he is eternal and ineffable. So this really seems to be describing the Godhead that we hear described in many different religious systems from around the world. This concept we find within Hinduism, we find it within many different world religions. This one unitative Godhead that resides at the very peak of all spiritual realization. Now this monad begins to create what are called eons. An eon is thought of of as an emanation of God. So the aeons or the eons, they emanate out of the monad. They emanate out of this one unitative Godhead. And they always come in male-female pairs. And so they sort of emerge and emanate out of the luminosity of this transcendent mystery source. The first of these emanations, or the first of the eons, is a character referred to as Barbelo. Now, Barbelo seems to be equated with what the Christians referred to as the Holy Spirit. And Barbelo is thought of as an androgynous male-female kind of deity that mirror images the transcendent divine. Concerning Barbelo, we read, The first power which was before them all was Barbelo. 
She became the womb of everything, for it is she who is prior to them all, the mother father, the first man, the Holy Spirit, the thrice male, the thrice powerful, the thrice named androgynous one, and the eternal eon among the invisible ones, and the first to come forth. The Barbelo requests of the Supreme Spirit to project or emanate a proceeding number of several eons that come out of the, the transcendent mystery source and then by decreasing degrees they emanate lower and lower until you come to, for instance, Valentinus who describes 30 ranks of eons. And then together with the spirit, Barbalo and God the Monad merge together and they conceive a spark, a luminous spark which comes to be known as Jesus. This is the Christ. Now, in the Gnostic thinking, it was Sophia, wisdom, that was responsible for willing her own form of creation. She wanted to create something without participating with her counterpart. She didn't gain permission from the other eons, and she didn't gain permission from the supreme monad, and so she begins to create on her own, and she creates this being called Yaldabaoth. So Sophia creates Yaldabaoth, and Yaldabaoth is this archon deity. He's referred to as the Demiurge, and he doesn't realize that there are any other eons out there. He thinks that he is the supreme god. And so therefore, Yaltaboath, along with the other archons, start to create the physical world. And they create man in the hopes of imitating the Christ. They see a, a vision of the Christ, and so they begin to form the shape of man and woman, and it's from this that the physical world is made. And so this demiurge, Yaltaboath, is thought of as the source of evil, and he's responsible for creating both the angels and the demons. And so Christ is thought to have come down into this physical world and to have assumed a kind of quasi-physical incarnation in the hopes of releasing men from this physical prison that we all occupy. There's this definite sense that the Gnostics appreciated that these spiritual realities belong to the cosmos of mind, this inner world of dreams. So in that respect, I can definitely preach what the Gnostics Gnostics were saying, but I hesitate because Gnosticism does not reflect any authentic Christian teaching. In fact, Gnostics were in existence when the Twelve Apostles were still alive. In fact, the first Gnostic that we read about in the Bible is Simon Magus. A really fascinating set of passages comes to us from comparing the Nag Hammadi Library to the early scriptures of the Church. We read in 2 Timothy 2, chapter 16, have nothing to do with godless philosophical discussions. They only lead further and further away from true religion. Talk of this kind spreads corruption like gangrene, as in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus, the men who have gone astray from the truth, claiming that the resurrection has already taken place. They are upsetting some people's faith. However, God's solid foundation stands firm, and this is the seal on it. The Lord knows those who are his own, and all who call on the name of the Lord must avoid evil. So here St. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's explaining to him, you know, avoid the teachings of these two men. And their teachings revolve around this notion that the resurrection had already taken place. Now what's really interesting is in the Nag Hammadi library, we have the treatise on the resurrection. And now listen to this. Therefore, do not think in part, O Reginos, nor live in conformity with this flesh for the sake of unity, but Flee from the divisions and the fetters, and already you have the resurrection. For if he who will die knows about himself that he will die, even if he spends many years in this life, he is brought to this. Why not consider yourself as risen already and brought to this? So in the treatise on the resurrection, the author here is stating that he's writing to this Reginos and he's saying, listen, you already have the resurrection. So you can see that this doctrine that St. Paul is addressing to St. Timothy is right here in the Nag Hammadi scriptures. In fact, there's a story that's recounted by St. Polycarp, a bishop, who describes St. John coming into a bathhouse and then suddenly running out because he's seen in there a, a renowned Gnostic teacher and he says, oh dear God, the roof's going to cave in, you know, he was... <laughs> 
<laughs> so worried about being in the same building as this guy because he was f- absolutely certain that the wrath of God would be poured down on him at any moment. And Polycarp says that John, because that Gnostic was in the bathhouse, he never took a bath. So it's really important to first and foremost recognize that Gnosticism was kind of a syncretized mystery religion that was, you know, very loose and undefined. In fact, we see contradictory ideas between different Gnostics. People talk about Jewish Gnosticism, and yet Yelta Boath was considered to be the deity of the Old Testament Bible and was described as a demonic power, a source of evil responsible for creating the evil physical world. So Gnosticism was really a loose term that just got thrown over a whole lot of strange ideas in the ancient Near East. I mean, we're not talking about a well-organized religious system. We're just talking about a term that was used to describe the people who believed in some very strange things. For instance, many of the Gnostics believe that Jesus was never actually crucified, that he stood off to the side while someone else was crucified and laughed as they crucified this false image. In fact, actually, uh, that Gnostic idea idea seems to have made its way into the Quran. The Quran makes these little statements about Jesus never actually being crucified, but someone else was crucified. And it appears as if Muhammad seems to have got this idea from the Gnostics. But we have other strange ideas. For instance, there's the Gospel of Judas that describes how Judas was the only disciple of Christ who really understood Jesus. And they said that the physical world was evil. So when Judas betrayed Christ and ended up causing his death, Judas was actually doing Christ a service by liberating him from his physical body. So there are all sorts of strange ideas that were, you know, floating around within Gnosticism, and the Orthodox Church recognized that these ideas were not apostolic. They were not ideas that were taught by the Twelve Apostles, and they did not represent the authentic teachings of Christ, and so they were put down, and they were rejected as heresy. But they did survive in a kind of quasi-underground. In fact, the Manideans over in Iraq appear to have preserved some of these ideas, and the Cathars of medieval Europe also seem to have resurrected many of these Gnostic ideas. But that being said, I don't think that everything in Gnosticism is rubbish because, again, Gnosticism was a very loose collection of various religious ideas that were revolving around the ancient Near East. And so for that reason, it's quite reasonable to suppose that perhaps some authentic teachings of Christ were preserved in the oral and written traditions of these Gnostic communities. Perhaps they were twisted or reinterpreted to suit Gnostic theology, but certainly I think it's still useful to be able to explore these documents in order to come to a greater understanding of the early church. Now, without question, the most interesting of the Gnostic texts that we've discovered is the Gospel of Thomas. And the reason why it's so fascinating is because so much of it is canonical. And by the way, canonical is a word that means measured out. It's it's essentially referring to those texts which are included in the Bible. Now, what I've done here is I've actually gone through the Gospel of Thomas, and everything that you can see here that's highlighted in green is canonical. That's to say that we can find it in the Bible. So these are not necessarily, you know, things that are that are controversial in any way. I mean, these are these are canonical teachings of Jesus. And so you, I hope you guys can appreciate looking at this how much of the Gospel of Thomas coordinates with what we read in the Bible. But in this video, I want to focus on the text that is highlighted in pink. And these are the more mystical teachings of Jesus that could represent lost traditions. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So starting in verse 1, we read, These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke, and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. So hopefully, you guys, after the end of this video, you won't have to worry about dying. (laughs) In verse 3, we read, If those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. So right away, early in the text, we read about this notion that the kingdom of heaven is something that is within you, and it's not necessarily something that you can find in the exterior world. 
We find a version of this in the Gospel of Luke. The disciples come to him and they say, what will be the sign of your coming and the coming of the kingdom? And Jesus says, the kingdom is not something where you will say, here it is or there it is. That's to say, it's not a physical thing. He says, rather, the kingdom is within you and it is already spread out on the face of the earth, but men do not recognize it. So it's this notion that the kingdom of heaven lies within the cosmos of mind, within ourselves. The Buddhists, when I was a practicing Buddhist, I would often hear the teaching that heaven and hell are right between your ears. It's this idea that the spiritual realities that we're seeking do not lie up above the sky or deep under the earth. Rather, they exist within the field of dreams and altered states of consciousness within ourselves. In verse 7, we read, Jesus said, Blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man, and cursed is the man whom the lion consumes and the lion becomes man. Now this passage I really like because to me this is a clear reference to the shadow archetype. What Jesus is saying is blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man. So that's to say that if the ego, here represented as the man, consumes the shadow archetype, then the lion becomes man and this individual is blessed. But if instead, when you start to approach the unconscious mind, you're frightened by your own shadow archetype, and that shadow archetype begins to consume you, then you are cursed, right? Now the ego has been eaten up and swallowed by the demons of its own unconscious mind. If you're not familiar with these concepts of the ego and the shadow, I suggest you go over and watch my series on Jungian psychology, and I'll put an I card up here, and you guys can go and check that out if you're interested. In verse 11, we read, Jesus said, this heaven will pass away and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive and the living will not die. In the days when you consumed what is dead, you made it what is alive. When you come to dwell in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you become two, what will you do? This is a really mysterious passage, and the first section appears to be referencing an apocalyptic vision, right? The, the heaven will pass away, and the one above it will also pass away. But then we come into these passages that talk about becoming one when you come into the light, and when you become two, what will you do? And I think this is a reference to perhaps the experience of seeing God. Right? This is the experience of having the beatific vision where in which you see the face of God and it's your own face. When you're one and you become two, what will you do? You'll be frightened by the nature of your mind. This reminds me of a dream that Jared recently shared with me in which he said that he saw Jesus and myself standing in a white light. And Jesus said to Jared, he says, I'm going to reveal to you the Father. And he says this figure began to walk out that looked exactly like him. And Jesus looked at me and he said, who do you see? And in the dream, I said, I see myself. And then Jesus turned to Jared and said, who do you see? And Jared said, I see myself. This represents the fact that God is the inmost spirit that is looking through our eyes and hearing through our ears. He is our true identity, this immortal Purusha, Buddha nature, Christ consciousness that dwells in the heart of everyone. In the Katha Upanishad, we read, there is one ruler, the spirit that is in all things, who transforms his own form into many. Only the wise who see them in their souls attain the eternal joy. Brahman is seen in a pure soul as in a mirror clear. So here the Upanishad is saying that when you behold Brahma, it's like looking into a mirror. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Jesus said, blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. If you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. So I love this as well, because here again, we have a reference to the apocalyptic vision of the end of life, right? And they're saying, well, you know, when is the end going to come? And Jesus is saying to them, do you really pursue the end when you don't know the beginning? 
That's to say that we're, we're, we're approaching the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And this I really relate to because of my own experience when I had my mystical experience where in which I felt as if the world was ending and it was consuming the dream of my life, that my whole life was being pulled into this thing and this was the end. This was the end of time. This was not just the end of my life, this was the end of the world. My life had only ever been a dream and this was it. I entered a full-fledged altered state of consciousness and it was an apocalyptic vision and I came up out of my body and when I returned from the white light, I felt as if it was the first day of creation. I felt as if I could remember creating the world and as if this was the first day of the universe. So when I discovered the end, I discovered the beginning and I recognized that the whole world being dreamlike in nature was truly the kingdom of God. So these are distinctly mystical things. And I can attest to the fact that I've experienced these things for myself and I know people who've experienced them as well. When you go into an altered state of consciousness, you can have this experience of seeing the world end as if it were only ever a dream and then it arises back up out of the void as if it were only a dream and you realize that the first day of creation can be any day because it's all relative to your consciousness to the spirit of God that dwells within you. In verse 22 we read, When you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and when you make the male female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female female, when you fashion eyes in place of an eye, and a hand in place of a hand, and a foot in place of a foot, and a likeness in place of a likeness, then you will enter the kingdom. Now again, these things sound very nonsensical, but I think that we, we're dealing again with a mystical reference to the fact that Jesus is counseling his disciples to take those things which are within and to turn them without. That's to enter an altered state of consciousness where in which the content of our dreams is projected out onto our waking experience and you can no longer tell the difference between being awake and being asleep. The bringing together of the male and female is something that we see in many mystical traditions. We see it within Hindu. Hinduism within alchemy. This is this idea of bringing together the pairs of opposites. This is the ego merging with the anima. Jesus said, if they say to you, where did you come from? Say to them, we came from the light, the place where the light came into being on its own accord and established itself and became manifest through their image. If they say to you, is it you? Say, we are its children and we are the elect of the living father. If they ask you, what is the sign of your father in you? Say to them, it is movement and repose. So this, I believe, again, to be a reference of the Dharmakaya, the white light that dwells within the void of dreamless sleep. This is this notion of the monad that we saw in the Apocryphon of John. And this reference to the fact that God is revealed through motion and repose really reminds me of many of the Eastern Hindu texts that we read. For instance, this verse from the Isa Upanishad that reads, the spirit without moving is swifter than the mind. The senses cannot reach him. He is ever beyond them. Standing still, he overtakes those who run. To the ocean of his being, the spirit of life leads the streams of action. He moves and he moves not. He is far and he is near. He is within all and he is outside of all. Who sees all beings in his own self and his own self in all beings loses all fear. So this is a reference to the realization of God through motion and repose. So that when you're moving around, you recognize that the Spirit of God moves wherever you move. Everywhere you go, there is the Spirit of God looking through your eyes and hearing through your ears. And then you sit in stillness, you sit in silence, and you meditate, and you contemplate, and you discover that root of consciousness that dwells within yourself. See, this is the revelation of meditation on motion and repose. We find the same thing in the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus as well. Jesus said, It is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. For me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. Split a, split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up a stone, and you will find me. Now this is a beautifully poetic verse which is describing Christ's divinity. And it really reminds me of the Gospel of John where he speaks to the Jews and he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. You know, this is this idea that he is the incarnation of this divine consciousness which has come down from heaven to be born of the Virgin Mary. 
He who is near me is near the fire, and he who is far from me is far from the kingdom. So he's referring to himself again as this reality of God, this reality of the Purusha, the Atman, this Buddha nature, this divine consciousness that dwells within the heart. And he's saying that when you approach him, you are approaching the fire that will burn away your attachments to this material existence. This fire will consume the things that you love in this world so as to liberate your soul, to ascend to the celestial heights to have the revelatory experience of God. It's like in my own testimonial when I described entering the void of dreamless sleep and I felt as if my very memories were being burned in the fires of the void until the white light rescued me and delivered me from that ordeal. When you see your likeness, you rejoice, but when you see your image which came into being before you and which neither dies nor became manifest, how much will you have to bear? This again is referring to this revelation of God as having your own appearance. So when you see God, it's like looking into a mirror. He's saying when you see your image, when you see your likeness on the face of someone else, how much terrible pain you will have to bear. And this is something we see in a variety of different religious traditions. In fact, I was reading some myths about the uh, Navajo Indians down in, in the Americas here, and it says in one part of this passage, it says, If anyone should be so unfortunate as to see their double in a vision, it would be a sign that dangerous things were about to befall them. Right? This is in this book on the Navajo Indian myths. So what's being described here is the fact that when a person comes into this realization of God, great unfortunate events are likely to follow. And you say, well, why is that? Even Moses tells us in the book of the Torah that no one can look at the face of God and live. If you see the face of God, you will surely die. And the reason is because once you come into the knowledge of this, once you come into the experience of knowing God to be your inmost true identity, then you are inclined to say to yourself, I am am God, which is not the case, right? This is the ego confusing itself with the spirit. The revelation of God's face as being your own face does not tell you that you are God, not at all. What it tells you is that your very person is not really your own. The you, the sense of the ego, this I, I, I that is marching around through this life is really little more than a mask that the spirit of God is wearing. And when you die, you have to be prepared for God to take off that mask. And you have to ask yourself, am I the mask or am I the light that is behind the mask? This is a traumatic revelation and the ego is completely shaken to its core and it is a true death. This is the highest level of realization and enlightenment. And when you come to that realization, it will shatter your sense of self. It is reputed that the last thing the Buddha saw before he became enlightened was himself. So this is a universal mystic theme. We see this in all great religious traditions from around the world, but for the most part it's hidden and kept secret because of the power of this revelation. And I should warn people even watching this video, be cautious with how much time you spend meditating on this truth. It perhaps could drive you insane. So let it be a word of warning that this is something, this is some pretty powerful stuff spiritually and psychologically that we're discussing here. When you make the two one, you will become the sons of man. And when you say mountain move away, it will move away. Jesus said, he who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become he and the things that are hidden shall be revealed to him. So I absolutely love this passage because it's referring to the Christ-like nature as being equivalent to the Buddha nature. Now I did a video discussing this, you know, the cautions we have to take with throwing an equal sign between Christ and the Buddha. But clearly here in the Gospel of Thomas, we have Jesus saying, this is essentially what this is, right? It's this realization of the divine within yourself. He who drinks from my mouth will become as I am and I will become he. That's to say that you become the Christ. One of my favorite examples of this is Saint Padre Pio who only passed away recently in the 1960s. He was the last real great mystic of the Roman Catholic Church and I really have a great devotion to Saint Padre Pio. And he describes that when he was having his first experience of the stigmata, he was in a church in Italy when suddenly he looked before him and there was this mysterious figure who was standing there in front of him. Padre Pio was soon to suffer pains that he would gladly endure, but a notoriety that he found hard to live with. 
The full and terrifying appearance of the stigmata occurred on the morning of September the 20th, 1918. Padre Pio was in the choir of the old church in San Giovanni Rotondo, having celebrated mass. He described what happened thus. I yielded to a drowsiness similar to a sweet sleep. And during this, I saw a mysterious person. His hands and feet and side were dripping with blood. This sight terrified me. The vision slowly disappeared and I became aware that my hands, my feet and my side were also dripping with blood. Padre Pio was 31 years old. And I love to point out to people, why did Padre Pio describe this individual as a mysterious figure? If it was Jesus, he could have just said that it was Jesus. Or if it was a stranger, he could have said it was a stranger. I am of the opinion that Padre Pio referred to this man as, the str as a mysterious figure because it was in fact him. He was having a vision of the Father. He was seeing himself standing across the church with bleeding hands and a bleeding side. And this was the realization of the full power of Christ within himself. He manifested this cosmic Christ principle within himself. So I think that the Gospel of Thomas represents a very mystical document that has been subtly perhaps switched or moved or changed by the influence of Gnostic writers. But nonetheless, it reveals to us that the teachings of Jesus Christ coordinate with what we see in most of the great mystical traditions of the world. This notion of discovering the divine within yourself, turning inward to the world of dreams that lie within and pursuing this quest to discover the root of who you are, this quest to discover the Father that dwells within your heart. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I'd ask you to like, subscribe, and share. Be sure to hit that notification bell so you know when I come out with new content. And as always, thanks for watching.